There are people at every level that are trying to scare the electorate. I don't understand that, so you better be very careful and vote against that and, and be against that. As long as they can get one church here, one church there, one pastor here, one pastor there, to come to their view, then they figure they have won. They have advanced their cause. So that puts the politician and the churches in a defining moment. It's politically motivated. It is about economics. It's about superiority. But it's in a defining moment that we can't be self-righteous and that we can't condemn those that disagree with us. We need to just eradicate the word tolerance out of our vocab and be inclusive because tolerance, you still got that hierarchy. We will tolerate you as long as you're here and we're there. We've got to be understanding and we've got to give our enemies the understanding that we're seeking. The assumptions I was making about the people whom I was approaching were wrong. My assumptions about everybody behind every door was wrong. I think it's very easy for people not to look inside and not to look at their own prejudices. There were a lot of moments of discomfort for me early on. One of the assumptions I was making early on in the campaign was that all of our volunteers were gay people. I remember the first time somebody said to me, well, I don't want to talk to you if you're a lesbian. Did I say I was a lesbian? You know, where did that come from? Probably the most personal growth achievement of the whole thing was getting to the end of the election and saying, you, you can't tell, can you? We're all human beings, you know? And one of the hardest things for us to tear down is that human face in front of us saying, is this fair? Personal contact is very important. It's hard to hate someone you know. Some people may not know someone who's gay. For many people, the conversation we had at the doorstep was the first time they'd ever thought about it. You know them, you know, you may not personally like them, but it's much harder to actually hate them. One of the things that is really important uh, is having a memory. Here we're going to have maybe a thousand people go door to door. How are we going to remember what they learned when they talked to a voter? Well, what we have basically is a collective memory. If we all take a minute after each conversation with a voter and then code them in some way so we all know what kind of voter we, you just talked to. Everybody we talk to is either a one, two, three, four, or five. Ones and twos are our supporters. They'll give us money. They'll give us their time. They'll volunteer. They'll put a sign in their yard. They'll do something. They'll, they'll, they'll make sure there's a notice in the church bullet. Threes are undecided. They're not yet with us. Fours and fives are people who are against us. Fours are against us. Fives are really, really against us. Ones, twos, threes, fours, five. That's how you keep track and that's how you remember who's with us and who's against us. When the Citizens Restore Fairness announced their coalition in a big press conference, it had business leaders, civic leaders, political leaders. Gay rights activists, religious leaders, Fortune 500 CEOs. These groups came together in, in really ways that oftentimes you don't see in a city. I mean, it's real hard to get some of the religious community or the business community, the political leadership, all kind of on message. Charlie Lucan is the mayor of Cincinnati. I mean, people say to me, God, I wouldn't want your job for anything in the world. Here I am in his house, and I don't know how to describe him. I got a great job. I mean, you know, this is the job I always wanted. I mean, it's tough. He's hard to predict. It's nasty. You never really know where he's going to come down on something be awful. If we didn't bring Charlie Lucan to the table, then the planets weren't going to line up. I don't want to pretend to you that I was a crusader from the beginning. I mean, I, as I mentioned, I've had an evolution on this subject myself. This is the right thing to do. Repeal Article 12 and do the right thing. We needed the leader of the city to say that. And it seemed to me to be just a question about fairness. But beyond that, as the mayor of Cincinnati, it was hurting us. Ten days later, in his State of the City speech, he said one of his top three priorities was to repeal Article 12. And I was just like, I couldn't believe it. And, and maybe I helped a little bit because I, I, some people thought it was unusual for me. I'm 
not the most liberal guy to, to be uh, so front and center about this. Who's next? Two people actually having a conversation, a clear and honest conversation about an issue, is so incredibly powerful. When we sat around the table talking about going door to door and doing the grassroots, you know, one on one conversations, people would get really excited. And, and you could see the like ideas like percolating out of them. I know that people think this was political leadership and business leadership and religious leadership, and I think it was. But I, I, I just would not underestimate the thousands of people that knocked on doors. It was just a people's campaign. It was a remarkably diverse group. We were free to say what we thought. You know, I don't think this is going to work. I think this is going to work. What if we tweak it like this? What if we do that? How about this really crazy idea? And everybody would laugh. And then later what you'd see is that that catches people's attention. So let's use it. Even just the name of the campaign, Citizens to Restore Fairness. Uh, who can be against fairness? People know the difference between right and wrong. And that's what we're dealing with here, is an issue of right and wrong. I just don't believe that every gay person that I've ever met chose to be gay. What if you had a son or a daughter that came to you and said to you, Mama, Daddy, I'm homosexual. Does that dismiss him from being your son? We you know a lot of gay people, and they're not living the lives that are described in the lists of condemnations that people like to cite. We attend church, uh, we participate in the community, and uh, make great contributions. I grew up knowing that I was gay, knowing that religious people would use sacred text against me. There certainly is a rising movement among faith communities to say, wait a minute, you've hijacked our traditions and our language and our symbols, and you're using them for purposes that are antithetical to what we believe. There's no reference, not a single one, from Jesus regarding homosexuality. Most people are absolutely amazed that that is indeed the case. I say, well, I don't take my word for it. Here's the Bible. Show me. Jesus never even mentioned the word gay, homosexual, or anything. This is not about endorsing one lifestyle or judging another lifestyle. This is about something we all have in common, and that is basic human dignity and legal rights that must be afforded to all human beings. This is about the denial of basic human and civil rights to individuals who are citizens of this city. It was very apparent early on that Ohio was going to ban gay marriage and Kentucky was going to ban gay marriage. Well, there's a, there's a battle out there. Gay people were going to experience a significant setback. The Article 12 vote last year came against the backdrop of this national and statewide debate about gay marriage. Who's really behind the gay marriage amendment and how did it get into all these states in the same year? That was no coincidence. This is about freedom, the restrictions of freedom, and it's about courage and cooperation and perseverance in the pursuit of freedom. We affected change. Not only did people vote with us on the repeal of Article 12, but they voted with us on the ban of gay marriage, something that in other counties in the state, that didn't happen.